Okay, are we all back, dear friends? Um, our speaker still hasn't had his legal drugs, but uh, I think the extent of the laughter, the intensity in the room, the level of attention, I think, is a, a sort of absolute um, testimony of the excellence, um, the critical brilliance of this paper. Thank you so much. Who wants to begin, or do I? Matteo, are you sort of uh, winking? No. Well, I would like to start with a point of clarification then, uh, also for the sake of the, the discussion that we've been having. Could we speak of a change in regimes of governmentality? Can we go with Foucault on this? For, in the sense, could we have now homo securitans, and we have to make something, the, the, secu, the secu, securitized um, uh, self, um, which is quantified, but it is quantified in a certain manner. In the previous seminars, we've heard a lot about the quantified self, the datafication. Now, you are going somewhere very specific, specific with this. So could we do the Foucault bit and then the media bit? Uh, change of paradigm, change of regime of governmentality. Mm -hmm. Over to you, if you ever get your coffee. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I think I, I think there's a yeah there's, there's there's a number of different models obviously that have been um, employed to talk about this um, this condition or the kind of emergence of this condition historically. One is of course the the, the kind of analysis of society as a control that Deleuze offers. Uh, there's the the question of risk uh, that, that Hans Ulrich Beck. Um, offers in um, in his work, and then there's also this the, the question of preemption and uh, of governance through forms of uh, probability calculation uh, that we also see uh, presently. So I think that all of these uh, all of these kind of um, all of these kind of offer different different models uh, for understanding this. But I, what I think. Uh, we can also say is with the present mode of governance that are offered by asymmetric warfare and technologies uh, of the self such as uh, social media, there's a direct con conjunction of the scale of the individual, or the scale of the individual data point, uh, the, the individual datum or captor, uh, captor that um, a system will will kind of elicit, articulate, frame, store, record, analyze, and so on. And the way in which these are, these are integrated into large global monopolies uh, of power. You know, so each, each um, one of the things we see with, with contemporary uh, web economies is the creation of monopolies, something that's explicitly um, promulgated by authors such as uh, Peter Thiel, uh, one, of the, um, one of the founders of, of PayPal. So the idea of the monopoly is the natural form of, uh, of economy, the natural form of culture. If we see that Web2 platforms or post-Web2 platforms offer uh, the, the primary forms of culture in the present or fundamental forms of culture in the present, um, the monopoly is seen as the, the fundamental economic form for these to take. Uh, and one of the things that these do is articulate a relationship between the individual uh, and the individual is generative of, of data. The individual is generative of records and patterns that can be further analyzed um, and large scale global uh, monopolies. Now, what happens in this in the constitution of this relationship between a, a global condition and a, the, the condition of the, the individual that the, the mechanism attempts to elicit or to track is um, the constitution of new kinds of data structures. So um, the movement from relational databases, which are kind of classic uh, row and column tables, to very, uh, very much pre-broken structures, structures that are, um, that are capable of accepting multiple kinds of data type. They are capable of um, having different kinds of uh, structure of data embedded within them that are much more, uh, let's say, 
promiscuous in terms of the kinds of data that they can accept and that they can work with and they can bring analysis to bear on. Uh, so the, there's, a, there's a kind of relationship between uh, individual data types, individuals that generate those data and patterns of uh, social relation that also are generative of the data, large-scale global forms and the technologies that they, they use to address those. So this is, this is part of the condition uh, in, which we, in which we have to kind of mark out this, this question of security. And one of the things that results from it is also uh, the condition of a po more polymorphic idea of security. The security, uh, as we know from um, uh, work by people like Louisa Moore, uh, is, to, is to do with probability and calculation and kind of uh, almost kind of uh, speculative investment-like behavior on security uh, derivatives or kind of bets on the, the, the outcomes of different, uh, the results of different patterns of behavior. Um, but we can also see that <coughs> the structures for uh, engaging with, with power are not monolithic, disciplinary, uh, per se, nor are they necessarily um, uh, something that is that is entirely predictable and dry. But they're also, um, yeah, they have the, they have this relationship to the anti-foundation critique of science, so that they they they're constructivist. So they create the conditions in which we operate in, in which they then govern. And they're also polymorphic. So those are the yeah, two kinds of responses I would make to that. Talk about capitalism and schizophrenia. You have it, mm. uh, a double pool and this. Was that uh, clear? Because I would like to follow up quickly and then I'll come to you on, if we do this with classical Foucault and regimes of biopower, there one of the aims or one of the side effects was a reinvention of the human. Something, as you said, the humanism is a side effect of a number of techniques of construction of the self, self-other relation, uh, a certain understanding of the technology of writing as a metaphysics of presence, institutionalizing the book. I'm cutting 2,000 years of history very short here. Uh, but that produces something that we call the human. This is not the case in the posthuman computational securitized turn that you're defining. Um, or is there here a reinvestment of something that we could call the human? Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about that from the, you know, from the point of view of um, media theory, uh, in a sense. Uh, if, the, if the book characterizes the, the era of the human, you know, so that you, you read, you, you read, and by reading, you internalize uh, the process of thought, and you, you then constitute yourself uh, as an individual in relationship to the text that is being read. Um, you know, historically, media theory would have said, uh, you know, following McLuhan, that we change our relationship to um, the self once we become involved in kind of global streams of electronic images. We become much more uh, involved in a kind of gigantic global synaptic sponge that uh, effectively kind of releases uh, emotion, uh, feeling, knowledge, affect, etc. Uh, in, a, in a kind of global uh, televisual community. What we find um, However, is that, this, that there is a kind of a doubling uh, of these conditions in that we, within the condition of contemporary media, there is uh, a moment of reflection and constitution of the self. And there's also this, this hope, as epitomized in this, uh, this PowerPoint slide, that there is the possibility for um, these kind of convulsive, contagious, uh, affective mechanisms uh, that, are, that, are, that are articulated in, in social media. Uh, but at the same time, these are integrated within um, systems of calculation, systems of prediction, systems of, of construction of different kinds of, uh, of subjectivity. So the, the, the grounds by which the human might become uh, self-aware are fundamentally kind of interwoven with um, 
calculative mechanisms, mechanisms of storage, replay, of memory, of calculation, and so on, um, that kind of change change the condition of, of the self coming to know. Uh, and this, we also see that these you know these objects, computer programs, systems, storage devices, uh, and so on, also become uh, the mechanisms of, of a, another kind of knowledge. They become the seat of knowledge in themselves. You know, so that the, the 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 place of knowledge shifts from um, the reflexive human into uh, you know, the data bank, as they as they were called, or into the into the 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 the, 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 the program that analyzes the patterns of interaction, the patterns of uh, data transmission, or that articulates um, culture as it emerges online. Fantastic. Femke, thank you for your patience. You had asked, to put, no? You were scratching your nose? I thought you were raising your hand before. No. Who wants to come in? Are you coming in? I see no. Jonas also being positioned for the leap. Who wants to go first? Fantastic. If you pick your nose in this room, it's yeah, dangerous. Don't, don't scratch your nose, ever. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was uh, curious uh, to hear more about uh, um, how we could miss the technical somehow, uh, because you're talking about uh, somehow the, the the fetishization of the algorithm as a, a sort of uh, escape route to not have to deal with it. But I would like to hear a bit more about how that happens and how it cannot happen. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, one of the ways you can observe it happening is, is, for instance, a lot of recent social theory um, on, on computational media or computational society um, is essentially about the kind of class, class division of labor within sociology. So you have people who do ethnography and will kind of do painstaking kind of observational work uh, on computer science. Uh, but then you also have the kind of the level of uh, social theory, which attempts to provide a kind of a, you know, airplane view or a kind of satellite view of uh, social conditions. And as with any as with any field, um, certainly as with the intelligence field, as we saw from that slide set of slides, uh, the academy is subject to um, you know plagues of plagues of enthusiasm for certain kinds of words. Uh, algorithm is is one uh, that works at present. I, I suspect it will probably last. You know, it's, uh, academic seasons are slightly longer than fashion seasons, um, so I guess it'll last about a year and a half. Uh, but you know, after that, maybe we'll we'll get people looking at systems more more substantially. But I think this the algorithm as it's you know exists as uh, the, the algorithm is attractive because it exists at a number of levels. One is a kind of formal description of a process. One is you know, an actual instantiation of that process. Another is uh, you know, something that can be written out in pseudocode as, as something that looks like, uh, looks like an algorithm or looks like a set of instructions. Another is the actual algorithm uh, written as code. Another is the, the algorithm instantiated in the, in the hardware and running on the, on the actual data. So this, this is an, an interesting object. Um, in that it's you know it's it's, it's, it's multi-dimensional. It exists at multiple scales of instantiation, and so on. Um, so it's obviously very attractive. But I think in in from a kind of software studies approach, we have to insist that the the algorithm does not exist alone, and it also has these these multiple scales of uh, uh, multiple scales of existence. Are you happy with this? Uh, Matteo, you're next. You're already in position. Maria brought the microphone well. to scratch my nose at the nose. <laughs> uh, no, I, it's very interesting what you said about, of course, the fact that today there is too much um, algorithmic idealism and too much uh, centrality hmm. given to the, to the algorithm. And, uh, of course, it's important um, um, also 
a critique that the algorithm itself is imperfect, that there are like limit of computational um, computability inside it, randomness and so on. But uh, it's interesting for me how the beginning, the relation between humanities and, and the digital were actually uh, stretched toward the other uh, side of the spectrum. So at the beginning, when humanities started to study the digital, they had only language as a form of, uh, let's say, as a cultural form, as a symbolic form of analysis, especially mm -hmm. natural language. And also, the, the way code was analyzed sometimes was a, as a kind of language, mm. and uh, often even sometimes as a sort of poem, as a form of artistic expertivity, and so on. And uh, Turing himself at the beginning probably, uh, also if you think, you think about Kitty, we can make a lot of examples of humanities uh, also in the German context, the way they've been analyzing the digital as a language. But for me, probably now, finally, we make uh, the kernel, the inside uh, kind of the machinic element of the digital, mm -hmm. of the code, of the Turing universe emerges. That is the algorithm. And if you do a proper genealogy of this uh, evolution of this uh, technology, we go back to the first symbolic form, it is the, the Turing algorithm, the Turing machine. So um, I'm wondering how much, uh, yeah, uh, there is a, this, uh, in this process of the rediscovering the centrality of the algorithm, maybe there is something um, yeah, uh, that maybe bring justice to a form of a real, um, yeah, real uh, historical development of this. I don't know if I um, yeah, it was mm. clear uh, intervention, but I have the feeling that between humanities and media studies, uh, yeah, there is still a lot of kind of balance to do between uh, the different symbolic form we've been used to, to, to discuss. Yeah, it's just a yeah. question going back basically even to Hitler, not mm. the way he was like just addressing. Uh, yeah, the media, the digital as a text-based uh, media. Mm. And without no mention, almost never mentioning the algorithm form. And today probably do the opposite. We just mentioned the algorithm without, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think, I think you could read Kittler differently through his writing on music, uh, for instance, you know, compared to his writing on, on text um, and his writing on psychedelia. Uh, as a kind of fundamental form of the of, of, of new media or, or of digital media, so I think that there's there's more to his work than has appeared in uh, you know fully in English so far. So the, there is there is a sense, however, within the the kind of broader so-called digital humanities that um, that the role of the humanities is simply to, uh, to apply code or technical technical instrumentation to the problems, the central problems of the humanities, that is interpretation and exegesis of, of, uh, of texts and of documents. Um, and this tends to colour uh, a lot of the ways in which, for instance, um, people have looked at, at software. So for instance, the, the way in which people would read, would read code, as you say, as a kind of poetic form, uh, and do, uh, do things like look at, the, look at the ways in which programmers would use, um, would, would give a cute name to a variable, for instance. Um, there's, there's obviously limits to this, this kind of approach since um, they tend to focus on uh, you know, very short programs rather than the kind of programs that uh, are millions of lines of code long that, you know, even, even PowerPoint would be several millions of lines of code. Um, and the way in which this, this kind of tends to, in, in the kind of way in which humanities have, have worked on, on software, tends to be uh, bringing things back to a human scale. Uh, the thing that you know, the, the thing that several stand, you know, a, a program that several stands as long, say, that we can understand and read in a, in one sitting, rather than something that is uh, a massive, systematic, uh, infrastructural scale uh, size object. Uh, so I think that's there's there's the question of, of scale, and there's a question of what are the, what are the modes of uh, interpretation, and understanding that are appropriate to a, to, the, to looking at these kind of systems. Um, and I don't know if that addresses what your comment was. Um, I, th I mean, I think to go, to go back to Turing as the as a, as a primary point, I think is is useful. Um, you know, to to, to reread um, Turing's Turing's description of an effective procedure uh, as as 
both a kind of um, uh, a recipe for making a mathematical calculation, but also abstracting uh, a form of work into something that can be replicated and turned into a machining process. So I think there's there's a lot of ways that could be, um, yeah, a lot of ways that could be worked through. But I think it's, yeah, the 36 paper and the 37 notes uh, are kind of fundamental to understanding the present condition. Are you happy with this? Yes. We have also have your reading on Turing. I'm looking around the room. I can't imagine. We're only beginning to sort of scratch the surface of this. Are you about to speak? You're sort of sitting on the edge of your chair, but it's not. The body language does not indicate lips. Jonas, very welcome. Grab a uh, mic. I really like the way how you, Rosie, are doing this algorithmic analysis of the room of like. <laughs> Like what is how you are like processing the data of who might make a next move? Like you're you're like the embodiment of these new security cameras, you know, that they are introducing, that are like preemptively analyzing potential subversive that's, that's gestures different. without yet being that actual questions, acts of violence. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for your talk. I have a, a couple of questions. The first, you, you spoke about or you tried to analyze the post-human condition through some of the Snowden files, the GC GCCHQ PowerPoint presentation in specific, and you spoke about the way that um, values specific to the humanities and arts are circulating or uh, reoccurring throughout this presentation. Um, but apart from, from having seen seeing them mentioned in a kind of cloud of terms around the set of people like figures, icons, uh, I don't know exactly how like what has been your, when an, analyzing this document and what it proposes, what are the exact implications for humanities and specifically arts? Seems a bit obscure to me how that, how the organization imagines to weaponize those um, in relationship to, the, to, the, to this PowerPoint presentation. And that brings me immediately to the second question and that is if the weaponization of humanities, you mentioned specifically sociology, history, psychology, if that is not an inherent part of the construction of modern propaganda since the First World War, um, from, I mean, you are speaking of GCHQ in the context of, of uh, the UK, the Wellington House is of course famously the first official propaganda bureau in history, which was employing exactly these uh, domains in order to create or manufacture a space in which its early liberal democracy could be protected and, mm -hmm. um, or at least could be communicated while weaponized at the very same time. So I'm wondering where exactly do you see a shift mm -hmm. from the way that the weaponization of humanities is inherent to modern propaganda, mm -hmm. as far as my knowledge of the development of modern propaganda today, so-called public relations go, where do you see the fundamental shift based on your analysis of this, of this PowerPoint? Well, I think, there are, I think the fundamental shift happens really um, in, in the Second World War. Um, so if you think of the development of the, the CIA as, a, as, a, as an organization, uh, one of the documents that they use to train intelligence operatives uh, to, to give people an understanding of how to read uh, a message, a coded message, was um, Emerson's um, book, Seven Types of Ambiguity, which is a, a fundamental text for uh, reading modernist poetics. So in, in, that, in that book, Emerson proposes uh, a number of ways uh, in which text can have meaning by allusion, by direct, um, directly specifying something, d describes a metaphor, synecdoche, and so on. Um, so we can say that intelligence prior to the Second World War and prior to Turing had a fundamentally kind of literary mode. Yeah? So that it was uh, the exercise of a certain kind of connoisseurship. We can say that the, uh, the intelligence operative, the interpreter of uh, encoded texts, was someone um, often trained in the classics, was someone trained in the interpretation of obscure texts in, in foreign languages, 
Um, and this was a mode of intelligence that was fundamental, as, as you say, to, uh, to the humanities. What happens in the Second World War is that machines become uh, involved in interpretation and encoding. And mathematics becomes uh, a primary mode of investigation. So Turing's work um, in decoding the Enigma, uh, the Enigma machine, uh, Turing and others, um, based at Bletchley Park that then becomes GCHQ, which is the document we see, you know, the same organization that produces the document uh, we looked at earlier. Um, once the machine becomes involved, there is no, there is no time for delicate, educated, uh, sophisticated um, exercise of learning. It's really simply about number crunching. So it's the, the amount of probability, or the, the, the amount of combinations that the Enigma machine uh, introduced into, into encoding mechanisms was such that you know, there was no way uh, that Emerson the Emerson's mode of ambiguity could be used, it was simply down to uh, questions of probability. And this had to be uh, something that only a machine could handle. So the design of these machines and the, the kind of operation of these machines produced a new, uh, a new mode of interpretation, a new mode of systematizing uh, relationship to intelligence and, and sig signal, signals intelligence specifically. This condition then produces the, the, the computer as we know it, and it's through its genealogy from these very highly specialized machines to those that we've all got in our pockets. Um, and now, since their, since their distribution and ubiquity produces the, the kind of condition that we're talking about, in which everyone's subjectivity becomes uh, a problem of computational analysis. And that, I think, is the, the kind of key split um, between the kind of the, the traditional kind of colonial view of the humanities in, in the way that you describe um, and what we have in the present in which the human is fundamentally uh, a problem to be decoded by by machines rather than itself so wh where does that leave no, because my first question was specifically about the, the role of arts or the role of humanities and arts mm. in specific in the presentation in the PowerPoint document that you were mentioning. Yeah. And, and could you say something about the exact date and context and audience and department that the PowerPoint was directed at? Like, what is it, what is it yeah, exact that, source code? that's not I mean, clear. That's, I mean, that's, uh, I would say it's certainly from the last five years, uh, but it's not, um, it's not clear. There's no, uh, when it became public, the metadata was stripped out um, so that we couldn't find who produced it, uh, you know, what data it was produced, and so on. So, it's, yeah, we've, we've looked, I mean, I've looked at different versions of the file to see, see what's available, but there's no, um, yeah, there's nothing available. Um, I would say from the, from the spelling and from the, uh, the crappy humor, I would say it was an English document. <laughs> um, then the question in terms of like the, the relationship to the arts and humanities. Um, my my impression is that the the interpretation of the resources of the arts and humanities is done through two basic mechanisms. One is through um, the way in which anthropology becomes interpolated and mobilised via uh, marketing and the kind of the discipline of, of advertising. So a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, resources that are in that slide, such as uh, Maslow's uh, Pyramid of Needs, um, uh, are, are from this kind of psychology, advertising, um, anthropology kind of nexus, uh, which then kind of draws upon the, the, the idea of creativity, of intuition, uh, and so on. Um, in a, in a way in which has a lot of kind of uh, crossover with uh, creative industries discourse. So in a sense, uh, we're not talking about art per se, art, art proper, um, but we can say some of the kind of, um, the ways of emphasizing intuition, experiment, creativity, um, that art has historically been a kind of incubator for uh, then cross over into uh, into these domains. 
this is actually really interesting because that makes because before you spoke about the fact that um, those analyzing data before uh, the computational term turn mm -hmm. were those with a specific literary quality or who could read or sense or have like a specific sensibility or sensorial consciousness of what the message could mean. Yeah. And in a way, you are that person because once that PowerPoint is, uh, once the metadata of this PowerPoint is removed, it is, you are exactly performing this mm -hmm. activity yeah. upon a document that has been released by those who actually have that computing skill, but through the Snowden release have, have removed it. So you're mm -hmm. in a way repositioned in that <clears throat> pre-Second World War uh, status of, of data analysis, which yeah. is really interesting. I have one more follow-up question, but I don't know if I'm taking too much time now. I think we can. We have time. Am I allowed? Okay. I'm taking registration for after you, but I will see any hands. Go on. Okay, so second, thanks. This is all, these are very, very clear answers, actually. The, um, the second question that I had was about your choice to discuss the PowerPoint as a mundane case when it comes to the inscription of scripts upon its users. And I was a little bit surprised about that. I mean, I understand that that relates to the content of what mm. that specific PowerPoint is bringing about when it comes to mass surveillance, data analysis, algorithmic analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the case of the, I mean, I personally find that the PowerPoint is probably one of the most retro forms of technological means that we're mm. still using, more or less, um, in, in the sense that even a couple of days ago, we had a presentation with a group of Filipino militants who use like, um, who have this kind of slides that they use to teach uh, dialectic materialism to people in the jungle and they just bring it as like eight printed slides that they flap mm -hmm. one out of the other. But for me, that's exactly a PowerPoint. And they give that presentation also 14 times a day, just as your, yep. the subject that you mentioned that goes to Miami. So, I, I mean, I'm wondering, how do you see exactly that a PowerPoint inscribes a specific behavior upon its, us upon its user more than um, the kind of, let's say, retro me forms of mediation like books or chalkboards or that it basically relies, that its logic relies upon. And when it comes to this, the, the, the forms of inscription in mundane technology that are actually substantially dangerous, mm -hmm. are we then not talking about the algorithmic analysis of Google or Facebook when it comes to the selection of what we see or don't see, mm -hmm. the reinvestment that this does in a specific class uh, interests? I only see information that is tied to me through algorithmic analysis of those mm -hmm. who are actually already having, that have already the same opinions of me, how this, this has influenced also electoral processes, how it influences the analysis of, of um, um, uh, the uh, analysis of, of, behavior, of behavior, for example, in security cameras that by themselves decide if a specific gesture at an airport or a train station might potentially have a future subversive outcome. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I wonder why would you why you would choose for the for the PowerPoint? I well. mean, uh, I would, because it's part part of a broader set of work. Uh, in, I mean, for instance, some some other projects I've done have been um, reverse engineering personalization mechanisms of Google. So using using kind of programmatic means to analyze the the ways in which um, personalization is, is is structured and processed. Uh, looking at the ways in which um, for instance, GitHub, which is a, a major kind of open source repository, uh, structures access to resources and so on, the relations between um, pieces of code, uh, analysis of the Afghan war diaries um, that, is, that were released by Chelsea Manning. So doing computational analysis of these, word frequency analysis uh, of these documents. Um, so in a sense, I, it's, it's I focus on PowerPoint just in this project as a as a mundane um, as, as a mundane example, but I see it as part of a, a kind of wider continuum of work trying to analyze the uh, the kind of spectrum of uh, the spectrum of devices, systems, procedures, and so on that are operative. So a lot of my work would be using um, some of the interpretive. Uh, capacities of, of computational systems, uh, the, the structuring modes of databases or um, rec, rec, you know, location and temporal recording devices to you know, provide a kind of critical analysis or 
critical use of the of these systems. Uh, but I also think it's important to look at things that are kind of outmoded, that that exist almost as kind of prehensile um, uh, organs within our kind of mediatic system. So so PowerPoint being uh, a fundamental part of these. Um, other work has been looking at uh, Microsoft Word, for instance, uh, looking at these kind of the ways in which. There are different layers and temporalities of computational systems, you know, that, that kind of have a an integral culture that we need that we need to understand the advanced edge of, but we also need to understand the kind of mundane, time lagged uh, version of as well. I, I just have the feeling that Last that is, round, you're yeah, sorry, sorry. I just have the feeling that that, is, that that seems to be more about about a cultural analysis of the use of PowerPoint. Which I thought was very interesting, also in the talk. I, I I don't really see how 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 the internal or like let's say how the back end of PowerPoints, but maybe that's something you know more mm -hmm. about than me, would specifically address the same kind of problematic as other researchers that we were, you are now referencing, which is on algorithmic analysis of of, of human behavior, and that indeed prescripts uh, future my future relation to the knowledges of others or social mm -hmm. relations to others or I don't yeah. really see that in the I mean PowerPoint might actually be more of a savior in that sense than than, than its problem <laughs> yeah I mean I guess what I'm trying to suggest is that um, there, there are various kinds of um, if, if, if we if we say that one of the um, one of the conditions of the present is um, big data, predictive analysis, um, various kinds of open-ended, un underspecified and open systems of surveillance uh, that, we, that we exist in, that also act as the condition for the creation of culture, for political action, uh, and so on. These systems are known by various means. So one of them would be uh, direct, or can become known by various means. One is the kind of direct technical analysis uh, of these systems. Others can be uh, explored by kind of hacking and intervening in them. Others can be explored by um, engaging in kind of social or artistic uh, intervention, expropriation, exploration of, of these systems. So these are all kind of different kind of research strategies. Uh, one can also read, um, for instance, the uh, the technical papers that underlie a lot of the systems that were that, that you know the kind that you mentioned. So you, you can look at the ways in which um, surveillance systems are articulated in uh, the publications of the ACM or the IEEE, for instance, and. These are also you know, very useful uh, sets of resources. But we can also say that there is an internal culture of these organizations and the way in which they frame uh, their, their mode of operation, the way in which they internally narrativize it, which is also useful to look at. And although this, the, you know, the, the agents within GCHQ will be partially using um, sophisticated systems of computational analysis, recording, measuring, intervention, and so on, they also need to uh, constitute a kind of working culture amongst themselves. They need to constitute a narrative uh, for what they're doing. And they need to um, identify themselves with you know, figures such as magicians or Batman or marketing executives. And what I'm trying to get at is, in a sense, this um, this double articulation of uh, the narrative that these agents tell themselves or in which they kind of pitch for resources uh, and funds within an organization. Uh, you know, one can assume that like any other state, uh, state organization, they're fighting for office space, they're fighting for funds, they're trying to get uh, extra resources for certain kinds of projects and so on. And at the same time, uh, use these these kind of ways of framing their their operation, which is, you know, sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated forms of computational uh, surveillance, and at the same time has this kind of mundane layer. And so I'm 
trying to think about these two in the same way that you might look at, I don't know, say Wired magazine, uh, which you know, has very interesting discussions about, or has discussions of very interesting pro projects that are technically very interesting, but has this extremely mundane way of describing them in business terms. So that there's a layer, there's, there are multiple layers of interpretation between the technical and the way in which they're described by the internal culture of, of agencies that allow us to understand some of the kind of permutations and shifts uh, within the culture at large. Thank you. Okay, if, I, if I can just annotate, then I'll come to you. I think it is the extent to which, in Matthew Fuller's work, you see this constant return to the imbrication between the abstract codes and the materiality, between protocols that seem to be far away and the constitution of the self. It really is uh, the, the early Foucault mm -hmm. uh, that, that also brings, you, uh, brings your work to bear on questions of subject formation which is the basis of our alliance in the work on the posthuman and the basis of our objection to the object ontologies who dispose hastily of the subjects because politics is not what they're remotely interested in, if we could even understand what exactly they're interested in, but certainly it is not political subjectivity. So I think it's very mm -hmm. crucial here um, because not all the people that we invited to speak in our series actually did raise the political as a concern that actually had an impact on the type of media and cultural analysis that they were producing. So I just want to underline that because I think it's one of the great um, features of Fuller's work. Thank you for your patience. You've got the mic. Hello. Uh, first of all, I like very much the way you weaponize language against mm -hmm. the excesses of this posthuman condition, so to speak. But I wanted to ask you, um, how do, do you think of anonymity as a technique or as a rhetoric or uh, practice in, in all these uh, different instances of uh, mm. posthuman mediation? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, certainly uh, anonymity is, you know, something one engages in, um, you know, as, as, as of necessity. Um, you know, I mean, just just as a kind of uh, a basic, you know, one can basically assume that everyone in this room has illegally downloaded files, right? I mean, from the internet. Yes? No? Of course. Of course. So this, you know, the, the basic um, the basic condition of information sharing and and access to uh, academic or intellectual or cultural life today is is based around uh, a violation of, of copyright and a violation of intellectual property uh, in order to get access to uh, books, music, films, and so on, basic kind of constituent elements of um, intellectual culture, we need to violate copyright. And in order to do that effectively, now that we have relatively good monitoring and surveillance of the internet, um, we need you know, we need technologies that at least kind of tip the balance in favour of anonymity. So if we think of the internet in the 1990s, used to be seen as a kind of, you know, polymorphic wonder playground uh, of, of information flows. Nowadays, I think we have to see it as a, pretty much as an airport. So, you, you know, you behave on the internet as you would behave in an airport. Uh, and one of the ways in which you can kind of... Um, <coughs> Uh, tip the balance in favour of a slightly more interesting internet is to um, yeah to use things like Tor, uh, PGP, uh, and so and so on other encryption devices. But certainly, um, if you want basic access to uh, academic texts online, it's necessary to use privacy uh, to use anonymity enhancing technologies. Uh, so the Tor browser. Uh, in the UK, there's a, in the last month, there's been a ban put on uh, book piracy websites such as libgen.ru, uh, uh, you know, fundamental technologies for the present academy. Uh, and in order to get access to this now, you need to use uh, the Tor browser. So I think these, it becomes not necessarily a question of, of principle, of, of kind of ethical principle, but it can, becomes a question of, of power. What can you get access to? How do you get access to it? And the, the way to get access to it is through uh, the use of anony anonymizing tools. Yeah, it was interesting also. Indeed, uh, I was wondering if you see a difference in using anonymity as a, as a technique and, and 
this uh, like the an anonymous movement when it becomes uh, yeah a, a rhetorical also a rhetorical strategy and, and um, yeah uh, following uh, this uh, interwinding of layers mm. as you said between the technical analysis and and uh, mm. more uh, cultural level. But in the yeah. reading that you said, it proves how difficult it is to actually use anonyze, anon, uh, anonymizing tools. And for a very lazy and illiterate user like myself, it would actually require some programming skills. Is that what we're really saying here of people? Make more of an effort. Is that an implication of this? I think, I mean... Which would be good. To, I mean, use, to use Tor is pretty easy. Um, it just da re requires downloading a certain browser. Um, a modified version of Firefox, I think it's, yeah. it's, poss it's, it's very possible. Easy. Encore and effort, as they said. Yeah. Looking around the room before I start shooting my next series of questions. Okay, then I would like to refocus on the question of methods, because that came across in your paper and it comes across in the reading that you said very uh, clearly. There is a major methodological shift. Could we run through the the so different steps of that, because um, you assumed that we were all as uh, brilliant as you on that point. Clearly, a shift away from anti-foundational, deconstructivist, linguistic-oriented, um, if I understood correctly, a return to constructivism, but a constructivism that is polymorphic and yet foundational. I get drunk just, just trying to follow the, the, what strikes me as an utterly irrational, zigzagging, methodological mess. Can you guide us through it, please? <laughs> Why would you need to resist getting drunk? I don't <laughs> getting I drunk on air is a bit cheap. I would like to get drunk <laughs> on something more substantive. Yeah. Um, I guess, I mean, yeah, the, 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 methodologically, I'm, I'm interested in kind of interplay between technical knowledges, uh, technical practices, uh, the way in which these, these have um, uh, a mixture of... Uh, aesthetic and scientific knowledges that are kind of imbricated within them. Uh, I think we can insist, you know, on using kind of art methodologies also as the, uh, the fundamental necessity of invention and intervention in the world, uh, rather than observation, you know, the kind of withdrawal, withdrawal and observation. Um, mode that kind of characterizes uh, some of the humanities, I think would be, um, al along with the, you know, along with the agents of GCHQ, I think we can, we can say that we're interested in experiment, we're interested in uh, creation of realities um, as part of this kind of constructivist aspect of the work. Um, but I think there's, there's also a kind of sense in which the technical has become so much part of everyday life, of political life, of economic life, that it has its own um, conditions uh, of, of, of genesis for new forms of life, that, that are kind of paying attention to those in different ways, and without kind of necessarily um, implying that, you know, a, a kind of supreme form of technical knowledge or of, uh, a form of knowledge that allows the superiority of the, of the technical um, becomes fundamental to, to understanding you know, the computational conditions. So re-embedding the technical in something that we would call the context, which, would that be the term? Yeah, and also, but also understanding the technical as um, you know, having many different scales and many different kinds of, uh, of characteristic. You know, so that, for instance, I think a lot of um, uh, you know, contemporary forms of music, for instance, are ways of understanding um, computational processes by via bodily means. You know, so the way in which um, the you know, I, think, I mean, one of the one of the people who writes well about this is uh, Steve Goodman or uh, Elenia Coniadu, people who are looking at the way in which uh, sounds. Uh, exemplifies um, rhythmic processes, but that are also um, algorithmic processes. They're also the result of certain kinds of 
um, operations of software. So that the way in which you know certain kinds of uh, rhythmic or dance-oriented music interrogate the relationship of the experience of dance and of sound or the intensity of, of bass frequencies and so on back to the, the mode of, com of, of composition, of circulation, dissemination of music, uh, a kind of fundamental um, ways in which, you know, in, in popular cultures, this, this kind of question of, uh, has been interrogated. Other, other forms have been software art, have been different modes of, of art um, that, that kind of border on the hackerly uh, and so on. And so, so I think these are also kind of resources we can call on. Um, for setting out that kind of that kind of inquiry, you suggested that Guattari's notion of the machinic machinic autopoiesis was a methodological ally. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, but also, also this um, the term in uh, lines of flight, uh, ligne de fuite, which is you know equipment. Uh, so thinking about, I mean, certainly in in Guattari's work, but also his work with with Deleuze as an interest in machines and the machinic, and the machinic understand, understood as um, processes of, of, of in which multiple objects, multiple uh, entities, multiple uh, systems become entailed in a, in a um, mutual kind of correlation um, of, you know, an engagement of process that is beyond, um, beyond the singular. Equipment is useful because it allows us to think about the way in which technologies um, produce social conditions, produce kind of relations uh, amongst multiple entities and dynamics. Perfect. Uh, what methodological value would you give to deception? <laughs> because that was the other big theme that ran yeah. through it, runs through the anonymity. Uh, it seemed to me that deception has a strategic function politically, but also a rhetorical function poetically. Do I read you correctly, and can you say more about it? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, in, a, in a sense, this returns to the, the, some of the work I've done with Andy Goffey um, in Evil Media, thinking about uh, communication, media, uh, as kind of fundamentally... Um, Implicated in question, questions that the, that uh, are around deception or around the constitution of truths, and looking at the kind of ways in which uh, these, in a sense, co-evolve, or the way in which they're, they're they're kind of mutually implicated. So this is where I think that um, if intelligence agencies are fundamentally uh, constructivist now, in that they don't just monitor, you know, withdraw from the world and monitor it. They also, in, as these slides show, kind of intervene in the world in order to create intelligence, in order to create events uh, that generate intelligence. Um, one, of the, one of the ways in which we can see this mapped out is in uh, A.L. Weissman's work, where he shows the way in which uh, the Israeli military and intelligence services will, for instance, drop a bomb on the roof of a Hamas militant, not to target that individual, but to look at the pattern of um, uh, use of phones in the, in, the, in the following few minutes. So who, who, is, con who is contacted uh, immediately following um, uh, that event? So the, the point is to not to target an individual, but to carry out a social network analysis uh, from that. So there's a way in which there's, there's both uh, a kind of deception involved in that they will claim that they're targeting a dangerous individual who's you know, uh, sending homemade missiles onto the, the nursery schools of, of Israel. Uh, but one of the primary functions is to maintain a, a kind of regime of, uh, of, of duress, uh, and at the same time to elicit uh, telecommunications or signals intelligence. So the, this way in which there's an ostensive aim, but there's also a kind of an, an effect generated by acting in the world that elicits intelligence. So there's, there's a, a move from the current cold observation to acting in the world in order to generate uh, 
data, effectively. So strategic um, deception. But mm. the role of trolling and laughter, sorry, I'm speaking my language, you didn't pronounce that, mm. but the role of uh, culture jamming in the 1990s language of, of, of reappropriating for the purpose of subversion, uh, almost a carnivalesque. Mm. That was also part of your discourse. Mm. I mean, one of my favorite ta feminist texts from the 1980s is Hélène Sixou, The Laugh of the Medusa, when she talks about the power mm. of laughter. That's also part of your anarchical self. Can you say more about mm. that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think is also, uh, it's interesting to think about the way in which um, the, you, you have, I don't know, very libidinal figures such as uh, Ronald Reagan, Donald Trump, um, Geert Wilders, these, these kind of figures that uh, embody a kind of transgressive, disruptive, bacchanalian, uh, nasty um, uh, kind of heroic figure, you know, the, the ability to say, what everyone is thinking, you know, this kind of the populist trope of um, being able to say the unspeakable truth, but which everyone will agree to be true. Um, in a way, this 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 mode of transgression that we associate with the avant-garde, uh, in some ways, is also now the mode uh, of a certain kind of you know white patriarchal power. Uh, that that enjoys the pleasure of speaking its uh, speaking its name, you know. So this the way in which we've seen kind of uh, an eruption of um, anti-feminist trolling online over the last few years has been has been part of this. Um, so there's there's a there's a pleasure in the exercise of power that is not delinked from its. Um, uh, you know, the pa power the exercise of power is not delinked from. Um, it, the, the pleasure that's entailed by it. In fact, the, the pleasure that's entailed by the, the exercise of power is in a way seen as a, as a guarantor of the authenticity and appropriateness of, the, of that exercise. So because someone takes a, a kind of gleeful joy in attacking migrants, uh, therefore there's a legit, that proves the legitimacy of their, of their claim to authority. And I think that's, that's something we see in the way in which um, these slides present a certain kind of gleeful mischievousness, uh, the kind of uh, slightly kind of boyish naughtiness that's um, you know at the root of a lot of their rhetoric. So the libidinal element here is the display of this uncensored glee in the performance of the very power that they know they possess through the massive identification of the. Uh, masses with them. Wilders would be the example. Highly, highly popular with the teenager population, white males mostly uh, dispossessed to a certain extent. Now, this is crucial because that brings us to the discussion of populisms that we have had in previous sessions, and populisms in the, in the plural, um, because we have identified left-wing populism as an issue as well uh, in the work of um, Beltran last, in the last session, um, the, of the mass movements, um, uh, Podemos, and, and uh, in Greece um, more than ever, where there is a, uh, a, a massification of a certain populism voice, but to the left of the political spectrum. Could we read them through this? Um, what, what is the term? I'm looking for words here. Libidinal figures, populist tropes of desire, captivating the social imaginary, um, being one of the political elements that we have here. And then a footnote, was it yesterday that a general in the Canadian army justified rape and sexual assault um, in terms of biological, genetic, evolutionary terms, had to retract immediately, but said, we have this because we are so wired that we can go this way. Oops, immediately had to apologize. But again, a naturalization of a certain form of white, uh, heroic, raping uh, masculinity sort of thrown in back to this. Can you say something about this? I'm, I'm interpreting you wildly, so um, mm. I'll send a bill at the end of this for your session. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the kind of the, but the, the wild, the wild interpretation uh, and authority as creative, uh, you know, is, is something that you know has been a kind of problem for the, for the left with its kind of asceticism, 
its puritanical nature, its kind of roots uh, in, in Protestantism. Um, and there's something you know that Nietzsche very kind of clearly identified as a, as a problem for you know socialism, communism, anarchism, uh, and that which you know many many kind of groups throughout the 20th century attempted to address. Um, you know, if, if a key slogan of, of 1968 was "All Power to the Imagination," um, and which also you know pr showed very well the the problem of that slogan in that the imagination can be uh, infested, driven by uh, numerous kinds of numerous kinds of desire, numerous kinds of uh, modes of transgression or creativity. Um, you know, I think then, then there's a kind of uh, a potential remapping of, of, of what creativity is set or what creativity or desire or the imagination is set to stand for. Um, if we if we if we say all power to the imagination, we 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 end up with what we've got in a sense because this is this is the limit of our uh, imagination. So we've we've had several decades since 1968. The imagination has come to power. Um, maybe it wasn't such a great idea, perhaps. <laughs> Who do we do desire? Is the last one. Who do we do desire with? Do we do Reich? Do we do Deleuze? Do we do a mix? Do we have to tell our students to please read some psychoanalysis that we laugh in our face? But mm, interesting. Who do you do it with? Who do I do desire with? What a saucy question. I'm sorry. It's a very <laughs> saucy question. I mean it very cleanly. Sorry, boys out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess Nietzsche is a starting point. Um, Spinoza, obviously, and Deleuze and Guattari. Um, Foucault, obviously, in terms of a kind of regime of desire, and desire as a kind of unnatural phenomena, something that is uh, already technicized. Um, but also, I think we could, you know, we can talk about, uh, say, with, with Nietzsche, the kind of the desire, more broadly speaking, as uh, will to power, you know, and the way in which specific media systems, calculational systems, recording systems, and so on, have their own uh, modality of will to power. And I think that's something we need to um, uh, catch up with and understand as, as we live partly in the condition uh, that, that is kind of set up by their own imagination. Wow. If you can survive that. Fantastic. I am for stopping here unless, uh, do I see Femke? I'm doing my fa fascist <laughs> teacher bit, preemptive strike. If you can hold it, then I would go give the floor back to our boss, to our to hostess. And we do our lunch thing. May I remind all the speakers that you are my guests on the top floor for lunch because we have to discuss the glossary. We will not talk, take all of your lunch, but please come up. To this. There will be food for you in the room and there will be time for you afterwards to rejoin the crowd. What a morning, what a speaker. Please join me in thanking him. Matthew Fuller. Thank you.